Israel took control Wednesday of a vital corridor along Gaza's border with Egypt, cutting off Hamas smuggling tunnels. This following the IDF's deadly attack on an encampment in Rafah, furthering its push into the southern Gaza city. Now, clenching this Philadelphia corridor has strained relations with Egypt, putting into question the 1979 peace accord. But per Israel, the move was necessary. Israel says that Hamas has circumvented the years-long blockade both countries imposed by using the pathways to funnel in weapons and goods. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu keeps advancing despite global condemnation and President Biden's so-called red line. White House Security Advisor John Kirby said that destroying these tunnels were well within the bounds of, quote, limited ground operation. Israel's National Security Advisor spoke out on radio Wednesday and said he expects this the eight-month-old Gaza war to last through the end of the year. Journalist Glenn Greenwald took to X, posting, quote, that means beyond the suffering of Palestinians that Biden will be financing and arming this war right up until Election Day. They've calculated left-wing anger doesn't matter. Here to dive deeper into this is Glenn Greenwald himself. Welcome back to the show. Great to be back. Thanks for having me. So do you think that's an accurate calculation? What's their math on that? I think they could possibly lose the election based on how they've handled you know, the Palestine crisis since October 7th. Do you think their calculations are accurate here? I mean, politically speaking, which probably is the least important of the considerations when it comes to this war and our role in it, but it's important to talk about they're very much between a rock and a hard place. They have no good options. They certainly do risk losing a, enough voters in places like Michigan and other of these swing states between the apathy of young voters or the anger of them and the uh, anger of Muslims and Arab voters who refuse to vote for them. That That is a real risk to their prospects for reelection. On the other hand, there's a huge number of voters and especially donors in the United States who are extremely pro-Israel. And if they were perceived to be even more so than they already are, to be antagonistic to the Israelis or somehow abandoning Israel, that could also be a big political risk for them. But I think, you know, Jewish voters have demonstrated for decades that they're tied at the hip to the Democratic Party. They never abandoned the Democratic Party, even when Democratic presidents like Obama or Clinton are accused of being insufficiently pro-Israel. I think their much bigger vulnerability is left-wing and, and younger voters, but I also think they're calculating on the fact that usually left-wing voters whip into line on election day, no matter how angry they claim they are, and that's not an unreasonable calculation. That is traditionally what left-wing voters do. So uh, I think it's a difficult situation they're in. I mean, Biden has put himself in, I agree with you, a difficult situation, but some of that feels like a choice because they keep sort of half-heartedly condemning or not liking what Israel's doing. They talk about red lines that are then continuously violated and say, well, you know, we, we don't want them to do this, but, you know, Israel is making it clear, and, and no matter who's in charge, I think there's, you know, even if it wasn't Netanyahu, there's tremendous, um, in Israel, support for what they're doing. They're saying, we're going to do, you know, we're prosecuting this war in whatever fashion we think is necessary. Biden is saying, well, we really don't like aspects of this, but also, we're not going to do anything about it. And the blank check we've written you, we're, we're going to keep sending money. I mean, that's the that's the commitment I don't understand. You know, I'm, I'm not coming from the right. I have less interest. I mean, I want the U.S. to be as uninvolved in, in the Middle East as possible. I certainly don't want to be sent, uh, sending money to Israel or really any other country. So that's the part in which, you know, you and I would agree on. And I like libertarians on the left. To, to work on that, you know, together getting a, a, a disinvestment of this war effort. But that seems to be the commitment, you know, doing anything about that totally off the table from the Biden administration's perspective. Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, you need this kind of uninvolvement that you're talking about was something that Donald Trump and the Trump movement and then eventually the entire Republican Party claim they believe in. I can't tell you how many people I've had on my show from the Republican uh, House and Senate and other conservative figures over the last two and a half years who are ranting and railing against our financing the war in Ukraine on the grounds that we don't have enough money and shouldn't be spending our money to fuel foreign wars and pay for other countries' wars because our communities are falling apart at home. And then I would say, oh, well, does that apply to Israel as well? Or do you want to, us to not fund Israel on that same ground, and they would stutter and stammer and try and find a way to distinguish that. But of course, when it comes to Israel and American politics, every value and every belief that people came to believe in suddenly shifts for a variety of reasons. As for Joe Biden's role, you have the perception and the reality. So the reality is 
that the United States is fully funding, fully arming, and sacrificing our own standing in the world to shield Israel diplomatically. We've repeatedly isolated ourselves from the world in international fora, including the UN, but other places as well, to stand basically alone from the rest of the world, only with Israel sacrificing our own interests, our own uh, standing in the world in order to do so bombs that israel uses come right from the united states the bomb that you referenced at the start of the show that they used to incinerate dozens of palestinian children and women in rafa were was were american made bombs as they usually are and the reality is joe biden for decades has been one of the most vocal and steadfast zionists and supporters of israel in the United States, and he continues to be. There's not a single thing he's done to stifle the Israeli war effort in any way. He had that theatrical announcement that there would be a few weapons suspended for a small period of time. The Israelis already have uh, the full stock of those weapons that we provided them. It didn't do anything. It was just a theatrical move. And But but in politically, perceptions matter more than reality. And I think you're right that the perception is that Biden somehow is abandoning Israel or somehow impeding the Israeli war effort enough to give Republicans that space to attack him on that grounds, even though you really couldn't be more pro-Israel as a politician or a president than Joe Biden is. Following Russia's invasion into Ukraine, we had a lot of rhetoric coming out of this administration about the international rule of law, human rights norms when engaging in conflict. And it seems that all of that rhetoric uh, is turned on its head with how the administration talks about Israel and Israel's treatment of, of people in Gaza, Israel's assault on, on Palestine. What does this mean for the long term, for the liberal view that international law matters, that human rights matters? We had the signing of the conventional arms uh, transfer policy in February, and then we had the invasion in October. And within a few months, under the guise of it's a, you know Israel defending itself, we had tens of thousands of innocent civilians killed. Now, the Biden administration promised that they wouldn't transfer weapons to human rights violators. And now we have this ICJ ruling saying that Israel cannot go into Rafah. What does this mean for the liberals' position long term as supposedly respecting human rights law? The idea that the United States upholds international law or believes in international law or rules-based international order has always been a complete and utter joke for most of the world. In the 1980s, Nicaragua brought the United States to the International Court of Justice by alleging that they violated international law by mining the Nicar uh, Nicaraguan harbors and to, for years after, you had civilian ships being blown up and civilians being killed in Nicaragua, and as well as arming a civil war inside of Nicaragua by funding the Contras, even though the US Congress had banned that. That was the Iran-Contra scandal. And the United States lost in that world court and immediately withdrew and said, we're not under the jurisdiction of this court any longer. And then after 9-11, after the Bush administration, the US Congress passed and George Bush signed a law that said that if any American soldier or any American official is taken to The Hague and imprisoned there, we have the right to send armed forces, to send our military to invade The Hague and remove our own soldiers. And then, of course, the minute Vladimir Putin is declared a war criminal by this court and cannot travel to a lot of different countries, we celebrated it as though we're the beacons of international law. And now the same with Israel. Israel doesn't belong to the International Court of Justice, doesn't recognize its jurisdiction. They ignore court orders that come from this court, the court that just two years ago liberals were universally celebrating for having uh, found Vladimir Putin guilty of, of war crimes. So this is so much of what the rest of the world sees that we abuse and manipulate and hypocritically selectively apply these so-called so, so, so rules of international law to our adversaries, but immediately exempt ourselves. And you know, if you're the world's only superpower, you can get away with that. The world is not that way anymore. There's now a multipolar world. There's another superpower called China, and a huge number of countries are leaving Western spheres of influence to go to China, in part because China is effectively exploiting this resentment over the behavior that the rest of the world sees. We finance these wars, we arm them, and then we exempt ourselves from the very rules that we claim we're upholding. You mentioned um, earlier how that there there is an appetite on the right for non-intervention and disengagement, at least on some subjects like Ukraine. And you know, I'm absolutely someone who would like that extended to other topics like the Middle East and Israel as well. And actually, I do think there is at least some healthy appetite among actual 
Republican voters among among conservative people for non-intervention on the Israel subject as well. I mean, Thomas Massey just you know won his re-election decisively. I think he was glad to have APAC call attention to the fact that he votes against foreign aid across the board. That it's that there's not a special case um, for anyone. Now, does the Republican Party, does its elected leaders, manifest that or take that to heart? Obviously, the answer has been no, time and time again. Donald Trump has been kind of quiet about uh, the, the Israel stuff uh, as of late. Frankly, he's been quiet on a lot of his policies. I think he's just kind of hoping general dissatisfaction with Joe Biden will help reelect him, and then he'll decide what his policies are going to be later. He's not going to tell you ahead of time in case they end up being unpopular. But do you think um, there is, you know, what would you uh, predict for the future um, on the right, you, you know, you have discussions with a lot of um, right-leaning figures like Megyn Kelly and Tucker Carlson, et cetera, you know, some of whom um, are closer to my position on this stuff, some of whom are you know, more in the hawkish position. But where do you think this is headed? It's always hard to predict with when it comes to Donald Trump because he says one thing one day and then completely embraces the opposite position the next. So much of what he claimed he believed in when he was running for 2016 was not reflected in the policies of his administration or the people he empowered. Um, the first incident that really caused neocons, kind of the Bill Crystal and David Frum types, to become fanatically wary of Trump and to the point that they went to the Democratic Party was when Trump in 2016 had this instinct when he was asked about Israel and Palestine of saying, we've been too pro-Israel. We have to be even-handed in order to get a deal done. That's always Trump's main idea of himself is I get deals done. And that caused enormous indignation. The Democrats attacked him on it for being insufficiently pro-Israel. And a lot of neocons got very suspicious. It turned out when he got into office, he handed Middle East policy to Jared Kushner, who's an Orthodox Jew, his son-in-law, and a fanatical supporter of Israel. And he did things like move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, something that, you know, even 10 years ago was a fringe position. And then Chuck Schumer stood up and defended Donald Trump for doing that. So in reality, he was an extremely, let's call it, pro-Israel or Israel-supporting president, even though I think he clearly has a personal animus for Bibi Netanyahu, has made some comments since October 7th, kind of blaming Netanyahu for a lot of things. Um, but at the same time, Donald Trump desperately wants to win, in part because winning might be the only way he gets to stay out of prison. And I think he's willing to say or do anything to make sure he wins. And part of what they're now doing is trying to attack Joe Biden for being insufficiently pro-Israel or abandoning Israel. And Trump is saying, I'm going to be the most pro-Israel president ever to the point where he saying American Jews who don't vote for me are insane because you should love Israel and care about Israel. And if you do, you would vote for me. How much Trump really means of that, how much he'll really do of that is an unknown. But it is true that his first term was an extremely Israel pleasing term. Similar to Robbie's question, I'm really happy with your response there. I think about the typical liberal not understanding the, the U.S. history of American intervention. We had this conference at Brown University 40 years after the Sandinista Revolution where many of the key figures of the Contras and the Sandinistas came together and reflected on what happened. A lot of the key reporters were there and U.N. ambassadors. And it was interesting because the Contras, which were essentially in cahoots with the Reagan administration and various figures in Congress or the Iran Contras, scandal, their reflection on everything that had happened was essentially, you know, if Reagan didn't get involved, if we weren't in cahoots with America, we probably wouldn't see our country destabilized to the extent that it is today. And I think a lot of the establishment Democrats want to believe America's the good guys abroad, that we're fighting for democracy whenever we intervene. Is it possible that the U.S.'s position on Israel changes that at all, cracks through that propagandized mindset of the typical establishment Democrat hardline liberal? Do you see that as possible in the near future? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the 1980s dirty wars in Central America are such an interesting uh, part of history because that was the Reagan administration, you know, essentially funding covert civil wars and selling sophisticated weapons to Iran to get the money to do so. As you say, that was the Iran-Contra scandal because Congress had barred the use of funds to fund the Contras. And so they sold highly sophisticated missiles to Iran to get that cash behind Congress's back. Um, and of course, the idea that we go around supporting democracies is laughable when you look at American history, even to this very day, some of our closest allies excuse me, are, you know, some of the most rigid dictators in the world, the most savage uh, tyrants in Saudi Arabia and Egypt, et cetera. But I think the problem is, is that Israel is always looked at as an exception. 
And I think it's important to say why. Um, <clears throat> there are obviously a lot of American Jews in the Democratic Party and some in the Republican Party who are inculcated from birth to revere Israel, to view it as their duty as Jews to protect and, and defend this foreign country. And there are a lot of evangelicals in Congress and the Republican Party largely who will tell you that the reason they're so pro-Israel is because they believe their theology, their, their religion, compels them to see Israel as this sort of special, blessed, chosen by God country, that that is how they understand their religion. And so Israel is always an exception. I mean, we've watched the American right pretend to believe in free speech and hate censorship over the last decade. And since October 7, some of the worst censorship measures have been implemented as the right cheers because they perceive it as protecting and defending this one foreign country. So I do wish, I wish you were right in that in the premise of your question, although I know you're just asking, that maybe Israel could change things. The problem is, is that Israel is always regarded as this complete aberration. You know, you have people with America First branded on their forehead, running around saying we must fund Israel and pay for their military and finance all their wars and sacrifice our interests to defend them. Everything changes when it comes to this one foreign country. Hmm. I would, I for one would like to see a more consistent America First foreign policy across the board. Glenn Greenwald, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it as always. Great to be with you guys. Thanks for having the conversation.